You're someone with a vision for your practice, for your side hustle, and for your personal journey. But when it comes to establishing your path on how to get to where you want to be with your practice, things get a little messy. You're also someone who'd prefer to go in person instead of to groups and listening to everyone else's story. To me, it sounds like you could benefit from one-on-one consulting with our experienced practice of the practice consultants. From $5.95 a month and up, you can work with a consultant that will give you more direction and practical tried and tested tips matched to you and your goals. For more information, visit practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. Again, that's practiceofthepractice.com forward slash apply. This is the Practice of the Practice Podcast with Joe Sanox, session number 1002. I'm Joe Sanok, your host, and welcome to the Practice of the Practice Podcast. It's going to take a bit to get used to that 1,000 mouthful at the beginning, but how exciting that we have done over 1,000 episodes. I didn't even include in the numbers, you know, I did this thing called smidgens with Joe at the beginning where I would literally like pull up my phone while I was driving from my full-time job to part-time job and just like throw in random things at the beginning of my podcasting career. So we probably with the smidgens with Joe, uh, we probably have way more than a thousand, but that's how many legit full normal size episodes we've got. You know, we are doing a series right now um, that we just did in the last episode. So last week uh, we covered why to transition to W2 in your group practice. Uh, we have Andrew uh, from Practice to Practice here. He's also a group practice owner and he has recently um, got some amazing HR training and passed the big old test and all of that. But today we're going to be covering the exact steps to go from 1099 to W2. Uh, This is a standalone episode if you just want to listen to this, but also just know that the episode before this really kind of makes the case for why and how to think through if you want to add W-2s. So, uh, Andrew, welcome back to the Practice of the Practice podcast. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. So glad to have you here. Uh, Well, last time we talked about uh, why to switch to W-2s in like three sentences, if people didn't hear that, what are the big benefits of switching to W-2s? You have a lot more direction over how your business operates, and it's easier to kind of maintain standards over quality and other things like that. Um, You get to it's actually a lot more efficient because there's less back and forth about invoicing and tracking and getting people to kind of align with the systems that you want to have in place and how you operationalize everything. And I think at the end of the day is you'll probably sleep better because you're less at risk at the IRS deciding you misclassify the people that work with you. Mm. So good. All right. So where should we start when it comes to the exact steps to go from 1099s to W2s? I think a good place to start, and this is one of the things that in working with somebody around this transition um, got brought up as a checklist of things to make sure you have in place. And initially, when we were talking and kind of looking at this checklist and have it pulled up in front of me now, um, some of the things that are on that checklist, you probably already have if you're running a business, especially you already have a group. Um, so if you are still in sole proprietor phase and haven't incorporated in any way, um, this would definitely be the time to do that. So part of that would just be a matter of registering with the state, deciding if you're going to do an LLC or PLLC, depending on the state requirements, um, seeing if like something like an S corp or professional corporation might be best. Majority of people tend to be LLCs. For reference, you actually can be an LLC and be taxed as an S corp as the owner. Um, that's something that my accountant had mentioned. So down the road, I don't necessarily have to restructure if I want to become an employee to myself. I can leave my business structure in place. But basically, you have a distinct established business entity to then employ people in, and that has a separate um, EIN, so an employee identification number. Um, if you are, like we kind of talked briefly about last episode, planning to have employees in different states, you're going to need a foreign business entity registration as well for each of the states that you will have future employees in. So like I'm based in North Carolina. If I wanted to have a employee in Tennessee, I would need a, at least a foreign business entity for Tennessee for that. So right off the bat, you kind of have some of your stuff in place for this transition. You probably, if you have contractors, have some system to pay them. Um, I've been using QuickBooks Online. Um, they have a contractor 
package that's really affordable to add on to that, to just pay people direct deposit. It's really fast and efficient. Um, at least to start off with, I'm planning to use them as payroll for employees as well. Um, but basically, you can probably adapt a system like QuickBooks to go ahead and run payroll and, and do things if you already have contractors or whatever you're currently using for contractors, add in the additional W-2 stuff. So that kind of simplifies that part of the checklist. Part of the payroll setup is going to include I-9 employment verification. Um, so I guess with contractors, you don't necessarily have to check their status of whether or not they're legal to work in the United States. But in short, um, with employees, you're going to have to do an I-9 verification to verify they're allowed to, to be employed in the United States. And then you'd use a system like E-Verify to just physically verify that, hey, this person's ID is really theirs and do the, the tax form switchover. So whatever state employee tax form you would normally fill out and then a W-4 for the IRS. So most of that kind of initial package stuff is going to be things that are probably already available with systems you already have in place. Or if you don't have the system initially, again, it's, this is the time to incorporate if you haven't already done so. Um, afterwards, we can start getting into like some additional logistics that are more W-2 specific, but I think that's the initial kind of assessment phase. Okay. And about how long would you say that typically takes? Like I know that every state like with filing and things like that might, you know, delay or be expedited, but in general, how long would that phase typically take? I think once you kind of have a game plan, um, it's going to be relatively quick. Now for North Carolina, for registering for the unemployment insurance, that was simply going to, I think it was the department of DES, I can't remember off the top of my head, but NCDES. Um, basically, you go there and you register and you kind of set up as someone that um, is going to be employing people. They're going to ask a couple of questions, which you're probably maybe not going to have answers to, like when is the transition taking place? And the North Carolina wants to know what's the when do you anticipate paying $1,500 out in payroll? Um, so you can kind of give them those numbers. If it's going to be earlier, you let them know. If it's later, it's not really a big deal. Um, but that was a maybe took a half an hour on a website to do. Um, the other thing that's going to be required that may take a little longer is to look into something, a company to cover workers' comp. Um, Again, I'm using QuickBooks Payroll. They partner with a company called Next. Um, Next is a company that is doing workers' comp for a lot of other local group practices. And basically, I think they're a broker because the workers' comp policy I ended up with is through the Hartford. But in short, your payroll company should have a link to be able to connect you with a workers' comp thing. And that's probably a 48 to 72 hour turnaround between when you put it in, you tell them roughly how many employees you plan to have happen, when would you like the coverage to start, and then my understanding is that's a payroll deduction based on the volume of money that goes out on payroll. So your premium's connected to the amount of pay you actually pay out. Hmm. So then, uh, you know, as we're kind of moving through that process, what happens next? Uh, what happens next is hopefully you're thinking about, am I including benefits or not in my package to employees? So what I would like to include um, with my current set of people and then people going forward, um, you can do a vision, a short-term and long-term disability and life insurance package for somewhere between $100 and $120 a month. And that may sound a little expensive, but if you kind of do the math on things to where, let's say your partner, let's say your full-time to be eligible for benefits is going to be 20 hours a week of billable services. So 48 weeks of the year, that's 960 sessions. If your average session is $100, which is, I think, for most people on the low end, that's $96,000 in revenue a year. So if you're talking twelve to $1,400 as a business expense for that, that's a pretty nice perk to offer people um, that, from a business standpoint, offer revenue is a really insignificant um, percentage off of things. So it will take you some time to kind of decide what you would like to include and what you don't want to include with that. And then if you're going to plan to do things like health insurance stipend, I've been advised against using Quersha from multiple people, which is connected to the health insurance marketplace, that it's just logistically more trouble than it's worth. Um, so you have the stipend route, which kind of gives you a fixed amount if you're going to like put money toward health insurance and or dental. Um, you also have the option if you're a larger group practice, if you did want to 
include health insurance for your full-time people. You can do that, but understand that the commitment is going to be you will pay half of the premiums or more. So if it's a $400 premium for an employee, you're going to be paying 200 of that. Um, but there's some options about trying to find plans. There's a thing called the professional employment organization, I believe is the term. It's a PEO. But the idea is you partner with a PEO and they pull together a whole bunch of small businesses into a large pool of employees to then get a group plan as if they were a company of, you know, several thousand people. So it brings the cost of everything down. Hmm. Do you often find yourself overwhelmed by the influx of client calls you receive? Receptionists are expensive, but you can't afford to let your patients go to voicemail. You care for your clients, so you try to phone them back, but more often than not, it's too late. They've gone to another practice. When you partner with Well Received, you capture every opportunity. Your calls are answered by professional medical receptionists 24-7 and they can support you with more than just message taking. They offer new patient intake, after hours service, bilingual services, medical appointment scheduling, medical live chat, and so much more. All this at a fraction of the cost of an in-house receptionist. Your patients are well-received priority. As a Practice in the Practice listener, you can get an exclusive 50% off your first two months of service. Head on over to wellreceived.com forward slash Joe to start growing your practice today. Wow. So then as people kind of move through this process, uh, where do we go next? Next and probably alongside is going to be coming up with the job description and the offer letter and the handbook. Um, there's plenty of handbook templates available. I believe there's also one in the practice of the practice um, for California. In short, basically your employee handbook is just kind of a rules of engagement guide to doing business, stipulates things like how does leave happen, Um PTO, any of those kind of things are usually laid out in the handbook. It's going to be a reasonably lengthy document, so plan on something that's going to be, be between 30 and 60 pages at the end of it and kind of summarize how things are meant to work, where somebody might find themselves like in trouble um, for job performance related issues or other things like that, what the plan of action is when something like that happens. Um, things like, you know, if you have someone that's pregnant and has a baby and comes back to work, you know, are they able to like have a private space to do nursing and things like that or whatever else is related to that and just kind of outlining those types of processes and things like that. The job description um, is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to be similar to your job posting. One thing that's really interesting and, and it's kind of been interesting learning about how our field approaches these types of things is our field's very explicit. So what I mean by that is our offer letters, at least the ones that I've looked at from colleagues and things, tend to be more really specific about compensation and details and things versus other positions that may put a lot of that information in an employee handbook. Um, so things like compensation structures, for example, if you're doing a percentage split, how's that defined? When is the payment for that percentage split actually getting paid? Is it on the front end and are you fronting it on behalf of, say, like Blue Cross Blue Shield? Or are you paying the commission side of things after payment's been received, um, you know, to the company and things like that? So our offer letters tend to be a little more verbose in detail, um, but in general, it's it's an offer letter, and ours are probably going to be more similar to what you have outlined in the contract. But basically, you're kind of teasing out your contract into a, an offer letter, a job description, and then having the rest of it in terms of logistics, technology use, company protocols and things, all of that kind of lands in the handbook. Mm -hmm. I love that you're going kind of through the nitty gritty and, you know, someone that's doing this transition is going to be like, oh my gosh, this is so helpful. Um, in, in the next one, and we're going to dig in a little bit more in just a second, but just uh, we're, we're going to spend a whole episode on the ongoing monitoring of the W-2 transition. That's what our next episode is going to be about. So um, if you feel like, oh, wait, you guys stopped right when we're getting going. Um, today is really about that actual transition of those steps. And then the next one's going to be kind of long term, that monitoring, paying attention to things, KPIs, you know, looking at your own owner dashboard, things like that. So, Andrew, let's let's kind of land this like what are kind of those final steps in uh transitioning from 1099s to w-2s 
I think really the final step, um, once you have your job description and the offer letter and, and the employer side of that paperwork together, I would really advise having an employment attorney who knows your state and employment laws um, to kind of look things over. And that would probably be somebody good to consult with on the front end, as well as on the back end. Uh, I recently read a post of a group practice owner up in Massachusetts that had an employee that went on maternity leave and wasn't planning to come back. And so was basically asking for a payout. And there are some Massachusetts state specific um, rules around employers and maternity leave and return to work and other things. And so um, it wasn't necessarily outlined as clear as it could have been ahead of time. And by not consulting an attorney ahead of time to kind of make sure those state specific things were really ironed out, um, I think they're kind of going to have to eat a big payout because of how things were left. Um, mm -hmm. So again, you know, it it's, kind of where HR ends and having that legality kind of, you know, blessing really matters. So I would say find some colleagues, find some friends in your state, um, check some boards and things like that. But having an employee or employment law expert for your process on the front end, and they can kind of look things over at the back end to make sure you're as compliant as you know to be going into things would be the biggest part. Mm. So awesome. Well, Andrew, we during this uh, series are launching a consulting package that's $5.95 a month. Uh, people can check it out over at practiceofthepractice.com forward slash W2. Uh, they're going to get three consulting sessions with you or they can split those up into uh, half hour sessions where they could then do six and a group uh, with everyone that's doing this transition of 1099s to W2s. Um, for, for you, what's exciting about the idea of having, you know, up to 12 clients come together and, and work on this transition? I think to me, what's exciting about having a group of people come together and do this is the ability to kind of collaborate and share kind of where people are at and see what's working in different states and seeing what's kind of consistent across practices. Um, there's a group of group practice centers in Asheville that we get together once a month and have a group chat going and pretty much everybody in that group transitioned over to W2 in the past six to eight months. And so it's been extremely helpful having that group input about here's what I ran into or here's how I structured things, especially when it comes down to talking about compensation packages, what's competitive, what's fair, what's functional, and talking through those types of things, as well as just how do you go about having the conversation with your contractors about what a future as a W2 looks like. Mm, so awesome. Well, the last question I always ask, and you'll get to answer it one more time in the next episode, is if every private practitioner in the world were listening right now, what would you want them to know? Um, I think starting W-2, if I were to do it over again, I probably would do it. I think you've commented that too. Um, it's actually not as scary as it sounds. Um, I know it's a lot. I know we've talked about a lot of checklists and these little you know boxes and things to check. But honestly, I think it's not any more work than we do for clinical documentation and insurance billing and these other things. I think it's just a different format of that. And I think once it's kind of up and done and, and going, you're kind of just writing it out. So um, don't be afraid with all the stuff that's on the setup end. It's just a lot more setup on the front end. And I think once it's done, everything will go much more smoothly and be much more efficient. Mm, so awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having me again. So again, if you want to work with Andrew to transition from 1099s to W-2s, head on over to practiceofthepractice.com forward slash W-2, and you can read all about that consulting package, and that's going to be kicking off in August of 2024. Also, we couldn't do this show without our sponsors, and honestly, like this is one of those things that I wish I had when I had my practice. Uh, again, I sold my practice back in 2019, um, but the way I used to do our intakes is I would hire someone, they'd have to keep track of how many minutes they were doing uh, and then they charged me for it and it was like well if I have a 30 second call does that count as five minutes or 15 minutes and it was just like all over the place um, and then when someone would leave 
I then had to start completely over. Uh, that's where Well Received comes in. Um, well Received is such a great service. Um, they offer new intakes, uh, people to help me with new intakes, after hour services. They're 24 seven receptionists, they're bilingual. They do appointment scheduling, they do counseling live chat, not doing counseling, but getting people into the intakes and so much more. And it's a fraction of the cost of an in-house receptionist. You can actually get three months, you can get 50% off of your first three months over at wellreceived.com slash Joe and I've had probably five consulting clients start up with them and it is amazing uh, to just see how quickly they can get onboarded. I actually practiced their onboarding process just to see and I ended up getting a text within probably an hour to say hey I, I see that you didn't sign up for a service want to just chat with you to see what you're looking for and it was just such good customer service so wellreceived.com forward slash Joe uh, is where you can sign up for that 50% off for your first three months. Thank you so much for letting me into your ears and into your brain. I'll talk to you soon. Special thanks to the band Silence is Sexy for that intro music. And this podcast is designed to provide accurate and authoritative information in regard to the subject matter covered. It is given with the understanding that neither the host, the producers, the publishers, or guests are rendering legal, accounting, clinical, or other professional information. If you want a professional, you should find one.